Thank you for having us here today. I think uh, this fits very nicely with the theme that Nigel started us off with in terms of the future. Uh, clearly, we're looking at not just technology, but also laws and regulations that uh, are really at the ground level that we're all starting to take advantage of. And our firm has been no different in that regard. Before uh, I take you into what we're doing and the future of what we're doing, I just want to take you back a little bit because I think it exemplifies history repeating itself. Uh, our firm now is about 50 plus years old, um, based in Washington, D.C., so we are the Washington, D.C. member. We are a unique firm uh, in that we have lawyers and scientists, and we don't do any IP work in terms of engineering um, patents and where you would see scientists in law firms. Uh, our scientists, and there's some 25 scientists right now uh, at our six or seven offices around the world, they're really looking at health and safety issues and working with the lawyers with the regulations and the safety. Uh, and our founding partner, Jerry Heckman um, and uh, Joe Keller, they were telecommunication lawyers when they started the firm well over 50 years ago. Uh, but we have turned into, a, from a telecommunications firm, to probably the largest food and drug firm in the world. And that happened back in the early 60s, late 50s, basically because of a cold call, so a call that went through our switchboard at the time, where we had maybe seven lawyers, um, to a, a gentleman on the line who asked our telecommunication lawyers if they can help with a new law that was coming out in the late 50s, early 60s, relating to food additives. There was a congressman in New York, John Delaney, who was convinced that the additives that companies were putting into food were causing cancer, and one of the leading causes of cancer. And so, back in those days, companies, manufacturers, could put food additives into food and not tell FDA what they were putting in the food. There was no, what we call, pre-market clearance that was required. But this congressman said, wait a minute, we need FDA to take a look at these additives to make sure before they go into the food and ingested by the consumer, the US FDA has a chance to make sure they're safe. That never happened before. So this whole set of laws and regulations were all about now food companies, you've got to go to FDA first and get it pre-cleared. Jerry Heckman, the founding partner of the firm, again, a telecommunications lawyer, receives this call uh, and has no idea about food law whatsoever. He literally goes upstairs to uh, a, a lawyer who's above us in our building at the time, who does some lobbying work, and he didn't want to touch it. Maybe it was a combination of food and cancer. He did not want to do that. Uh, the story goes that Jerry Hackman went to three or four of the law firms over the course of a week and basically said, F it. I didn't say the whole word. I'm going to do this. I'm going to take this on. And that was something that he always taught us. I worked with Jerry for, for at least five or six years before he passed away. Uh, but it was always his theory that if you don't know something, learn it. And so he took this one area of law, he learned it, he testified before Congress because no one else was at the time, and we became the largest food and drug firm in the world over the last 50 years as a result of that. So why am I bringing you back in time when this whole theme is future? I say this example and, 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 and how our firm really was, became who we are today because that whole story repeated itself in 2010. It wasn't a phone call at the firm, but it was a young lawyer at the time who was walking through the mall shopping. This lawyer apparently likes to shop. Uh, and he saw a kiosk. Kiosk, for those of you who don't know, are these sort of vendors that are in the middle of the mall that you can stop and buy things outside of those brick and mortar stores. And this young lawyer uh, saw a kiosk or a table with a gentleman from maybe Israel uh, selling these devices that at first appearance looked like a cigarette. And when he approached the counter, he saw that this was indeed not a cigarette, but something that looked like it, but was in its electric form. Uh, at the time, they were calling that, still do, e-cigalites. So all of you probably have seen these with the little tip that lights up when you inhale it. And this was the first generation of what we're seeing, and Azim will certainly talk much more about today. But Azim asked this gentleman what, what these products were and became very intrigued by it. And so he actually went back uh, to his home and office, and he started to just research what this is all about. No one knew anything about this. No one. This was just guys selling this in a mall. And he started to write an article. And that was one of the other things that Jerry Ackman told us to do. If you want to get into something, just write about it. People will call you if you write about it. 
So he started to write about it, article after article. And in his articles, he realized while preparing and researching, there were no rules, laws, or regulations relating to how you sell these products. Is it a drug? Is it a medical device? What is it? Is it tobacco? And so he started to write articles questioning these products and questioning and predicting how FDA should regulate these products. And here we are now, eight years later, and you have the unique privilege, and I have the unique privilege of working with him uh, on virtually a daily basis, uh, who is now the leading expert in the world on e-cigarettes and e-cigarette related products. And so uh, Azim is gonna now take over. Uh, I'm gonna finish up with the global scheme because Azim has been kind enough to share his practice with me in Shanghai, uh, where I'll talk to you about what's going on there with, with this e-cigarette uh, products. Uh, but Azim is now the leading expert in this area, and he's a great example to those young lawyers who are here today that if you don't know something, probably no one else does, research it, and you never know when this new regulation and new laws can lead to a new practice. He has literally saved partners' practices in our other offices who may have been slow at one time, are now doing all sorts of e-cigarette litigation uh, and other types of practice areas, including uh, working with many of you over the last year or two on issues related to tax and other issues that we don't do. So let's talk about what we do do, and as your Azim is going through this presentation, listen to some things that could actually impact you, your firm, and your clients, because the opportunities still are very much at ground floor, and we want to bring you up this building with us to help us grow this, this regulatory industry. So Azim. Well, thank you, David. His, his introductions always sound so much better. It comes from him and not from me, so I appreciate that very much. Um, before I get into the presentation, I wanted to quickly introduce and welcome a guest we have here joining us. Pablo, please stand up. Pablo is uh, based here in Barcelona uh, with an organization called eSync Intelligence. They are an online uh, platform that, has, that, that is a resource that we use frequently at the firm and many companies use, um, not just e-cigarettes, but also I believe cannabis and CBD and other similar type products. Um, it's an online platform that provides legal research, market trend, information, data pricing, very useful resource that, and I'm glad you could be here today to join us uh, here in Barcelona. So um, a quick history about how this whole industry started. Contrary to popular belief, it was not started by big tobacco. That's a common myth that people believe e-cigarettes or vapor products, as they're called today, um, were, were just the sort of next generation of big tobacco products looking to switch you from you know, cigarettes. Um, in fact, the modern e-cigarette was developed in China by a pharmacist in 2003 who was also a part-time inventor. And he was a long-time smoker, as, as many folks uh, are, in this, uh, particularly in China. Uh, and his father had recently passed away from lung cancer. And the story is that he uh, was distraught and, and had a dream one night that he was floating in a cloud of vapor. And that gave him the idea of, hey, why can't I take away the tobacco and the smoke and, and develop a product that just focuses on the nicotine, but without that, but only the vapor. And so he developed a modern e-cigarette, um, which, he, which he patented and, and brought to the market um, later that decade, 2006 and 2007. So what is an e-cigarette? E-cigarette, very simply, is a, a battery-powered device that, uh, that heats what's called an atomizer. And that atomizer has a, has a coil or other substance that then is in contact with what's called an e-liquid. That e-liquid typically contains uh, propylene glycol, glycerin, flavorings, and perhaps nicotine, um, which is then, because of the heating factor, turned into a vapor which can be inhaled. So it does not actually contain any tobacco or any of the um, things that are commonly think of when you, when you think of a, a cigarette. Now, um, when you what you see here is it is the sort of a, the model of a first generation, as David mentioned, cigalike. These products were intended to. Uh, look and feel and, and, and mimic uh, sort of the hand-to-mouth action of a traditional tobacco cigarette. Um, since then, products have uh, evolved tremendously. So this was probably 2006, 2007. Um, this is a highly innovative industry 
Um, we saw consumers who were using these products um, transition and start their own businesses uh, and create their own sort of mods, as they're called. So the industry went from the first generation SIGA-likes to more advanced uh, personal vaporizers or open system products, which are uh, refillable products. So these SIGA-like products were closed systems, meaning um, they contained uh, the liquid that was pre-filled by the manufacturer. So they were not intended to be manipulated by, by the consumer. Um, but the more common product today that you'll probably see in people vaping uh, tend to be open system devices that uh, are bigger, they have more powerful batteries, they have uh, more, you know, a lot of safety features to prevent things like overheating, um, and they deliver the nicotine uh, or whatever chemicals in, in the uh, e-liquid um, more effectively to mimic the act of smoking. Um, although they don't look like a traditional cigarette, they actually are designed with the intent of not looking like a traditional cigarette. Um, and they come in a lot of flavors. So, I don't know, how many people here are familiar with, with vaping and the different types of flavors? Okay, a handful of folks. Um, it's definitely becoming more popular, as we'll get into, but one of the things that makes it more popular is the fact that uh, you can purchase these products in a variety of, of different uh, flavors. More recently, we have seen a sort of hybrid type of product that combines some of the benefits of open and closed systems, and they're called pod systems. Uh, these have these products um, are they're technically closed because uh, as opposed to dripping your own liquid into a tank, you have a closed pod, but you have the convenience of a of a smaller stick-like type product that is easier to carry, but that has some of the power and some of the features of a of a, of a more advanced vaporizer. So that's some of the stuff that we've seen um, more recently. So what has happened is literally since 2006, the market has just exploded in the US and around the world as, as millions of people have found these products and are, uh, you know, most of them are former smokers who are, who are switching to bigger products. So in 2007, it was probably close to, you know, $50 million industry in the United States. Today, it's about $5.5 .5 billion industry just in the US alone. And, um, and just as big around, around the world, particularly in, in, in Europe, and we're starting to see more in Asia as well. Um, compare that still to the actual tobacco industry, which is still in the US, about a $90 billion market. And that's, that's falling, but that gives you an idea of, of the potential room to grow that this industry has. So, you know, 5.5 billion is a, is a large number, but there's still a, a lot of, um, of tobacco being sold. Part of the reason we have seen such a tremendous growth in the US and around the world um, is because of something, a unique sort of uh, feature of this industry, uh, the brick and mortar vape shop. Um, those of you who, who, who have seen vapor products have probably seen vape shops. They're all over the United States. You're seeing them in Europe. I just saw one a few blocks from here, down the street. Um, there's a vape shop, and I'm sure Pablo can probably identify where, where they all are here in, in Barcelona. Um, but vape shops are these brick and mortar locations where um, you can actually go in and buy and try and, and sample different types of, of vapor products. And for a, a smoker who is looking to reduce the harm, because that's what these products are, it's the reduced harm products, uh, from cigarettes, it's important to, to go into these, these shops and, and find the product that, it, that is, you know, works for you, the flavors that, that you enjoy to switch. Um, so this is a, a unique thing that we see happening in the US. I think even David's seen it probably in Shanghai a lot more these days. In Shanghai, as people get into, in China, uh, the tobacco industry is a sort of unique monopoly situation, but we're seeing that change over time. So what has been the impact of this, of these products on overall tobacco and nicotine use? So what's happened is, since 2007, and for years this has been happening, this leading up to this, the actual smoking rate is, is falling rapidly in countries like the US and in the UK, where these products are readily available. And uh, the, the theory is that e-cigarettes have played a large role in, in reducing actual smoking rates uh, across um, age groups. So not just adults, but um, others as well. Uh, and that's a good thing. You know, it's a good thing for public health if people are, are using, smokers are switching to these products because again, 
Uh, I'm not going to get into all the details during this presentation because we don't have too much time. But there is a lot of controversy in this area, but there is a lot of science being developed constantly about the pros and cons of these products. Um, in the UK, for example, we're going to talk about some of the uh, different trends that we're seeing. Uh, in the UK, uh, they've taken a, a harm reduction approach where they are promoting vaping products to, to smokers as a means of transitioning or reducing your harm. Uh, in the US, it's, it's much more of a precautionary principle approach to regulation where the public health groups tend to be just very, you know, very much anti-tobacco and uh, you know, started off with the, you know, the position that vaping is, is still in tobacco use. But what we're learning from the science and the data that's coming out, because it's now been out for over 10 years, is that people, the primary users of these products are, are adults who were already smoking. And um, there's always a concern about uh, young people or non-smoking picking up something that could be potentially addictive, because nicotine is definitely an addictive substance. Um, but we're seeing the trend away from smoking, and again, that's a good thing for public health. So the questions that we deal with um, on, a, on a regulatory level is, as, how are these products regulated, as David hinted? Uh, and, and in the US, a law was passed in 2009, the Tobacco Control Act, which actually gave the Food and Drug Administration uh, authority for the first time to regulate tobacco products. And in 2016, that authority was extended to uh,